Hello and welcome to a brand new Arseblog Arsecast right here on Arseblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. We're another week into the summer. We're another week closer to the start of preseason and we have signed a grand total of... Um, let me see. Do, do, do. No players. And we've also sold a grand total of. No players. But that's fine. That's fine. I'm completely and utterly chilled out. The way to do this, the way to remain completely stress free is to set your expectations so low that any tiny little thing that happens is going to be fucking amazing. Think of it like starving yourself. A sort of hunger strike for no other reason than you just want bad food to taste good. Which isn't a great reason for hunger strike. Many people have gone on hunger strike down the years for for causes, for things that they believed in. They've died for those causes, literally starved themselves to death. That's not what this is about. Nobody should starve themselves to death. Not unless you really want to. I mean, I can't stop you. If that's what you want to do, fine. I'm not recommending it as a course of action. That's, that's all I'm saying here. But if you don't eat anything for a week, and then you eat, I don't know, some boiled cabbage, the cabbage is going to be much more delicious than it would be if you'd eaten every day. You see? If you'd had a sandwich one day and pizza the next day and fried chicken another day and something vegan, I guess. I don't know. I'm trying to be inclusive here, like butternut squash and chickpeas and and tomatoes and, you know, all done in a sauce and spinach. It's quite nice. I like it. But if you eat that all the time and then you get the boiled cabbage, the boiled cabbage is fucking disgusting. So it's about making sure that when we're given the boiled cabbage... In the transfer market this summer, we go, mm, yum, 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 yum. That was so good. Rather than saying, well, that, that's disgusting. Why are, you giving, why are you giving me that? I don't want that. I am not even remotely satisfied by that. I'm going to complain at once to the head waiter. And the head waiter, he'll go to the restaurant owner, and the restaurant owner will sit there in Los Angeles or Denver or his ranch in Texas or wherever the hell he is, and he'll say... I don't care what this guy says. It just doesn't matter to me. So, having wandered very far off topic already, my point is... What is my point? I think my point is that we want something a bit better than boiled cabbage. That's what I was getting around to. It might not be filet mignon this summer or any summer ever again. (laughs) But at least we could have something better than, than boiled cabbage. Don't make us eat boiled cabbage, please. It's too green and irony and stuff. And I'd like something a little more uh, flavorful this summer. Are they cooking up something delicious in the Arsenal kitchen? Is the head chef Raul Sanyehi and his, his various commie chefs and sous chefs and assistant first uh, mate chefs, are they doing the prep and, you know, making the sauces and flambéing the watsits? I hope so. I hope so. Because we're getting hungry here. We're getting hungry for stuff that isn't boiled cabbage, just to hammer home that particular point. Today's show, we are going to talk in a moment to our guest, Michael Cox. You will know him, of course, as Zonal Marking. Uh, He's got a new book out, so we're going to talk about that in a few minutes' time. But really, there hasn't been a great deal going on this week. Lots of spurious transfer rumors. There doesn't appear to be anything close or on the verge of being done, though. Lots of young players being linked, of course. Uh, People whose names I can't pronounce. People whose names I can't remember. People who, who aren't even born yet. That's how young they are as we get ready to embark on uh, Project Youth. Of course, the club did confirm this week that Freddie Umberg and Steve Bold would be doing a bit of an old swap rooney there with the jobs. Steve Bold going back to work with the under-23s and per Mertesacker, somewhere where he's felt very uh, comfortable and has done good work in the past. Freddie Jumberg as part of a transition team to bring young players through to the first team squad from the academy. He knows them very well, of course, as the manager of the under-23s last season. He'll know more or less who is ready or who's capable of potentially making the step up to first-team football with Unai Emery, and it's great. You know, the positive uh, spin on this 
is that we are going to focus on youth. We are going to really bring through players from our academy, and they're going to blossom, and it's going to be awesome, and they're going to be they're going to be chomping at the bit. We're going to have a load of Arsenal boys in the team, and that's going to make a difference. And you know, if you thought this was completely and utterly a strategy based on the readiness and the uh, the potential and the talent of these players, that there was no other way to do it, that we would be doing them a disservice if we didn't bring them through. That would be one thing. It does feel to me a bit like this is kind of the only thing that's open to us based on the transfer budget that we have and based on how much we need to do in the squad. So while we're all excited by it, I think we have to be slightly realistic about just how many of these young players are going to be able to make the step up. It is a risk. It's a high-risk strategy. You know, you can sell it in this really, really romantic way because we can all get behind the idea of young Arsenal lads coming through and making it to the first team. It's brilliant in our hearts and maybe it's not quite as brilliant in our heads when you step back and think about it. So I I hope it works. I hope, I hope, I hope it really works. But... I just feel like perhaps we're being forced into this strategy because there isn't enough money to do what we need to do with the squad this summer. So it's a little bit of a, not bittersweet, but I think you have to look at it uh, from both sides. Uh, The club presented it very well, as you would expect, but we can't ignore the other side of it. We can't ignore the risks of it. We can't ignore the fact that there are going to be clubs behind us who are going to spend a lot more than us, it seems, this summer, and that could make our job going into next season even more difficult. However, however, we'll see where we are when we do get some business done and how we feel about things then. Until that time, we just can't make any real assessment beyond being you know, a bit worried about what's going to happen because uh, don't want boiled cabbage, do not want boiled cabbage. Right. Delighted to welcome back to the show a man who I'm sure many of you follow on Twitter. You've read his website, Zonal Marking. He's got a brand new book out called Zonal Marking, the making of European football, looking back on the developments over the last uh, two or three decades. It's Michael Cox. Hi, Michael. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me on, Andrew. My pleasure. The first thing that occurred to me is reading this book, you go through various eras Uh, and various developments within European football, from the Dutch to Italian to French to Spanish to German. And it struck me like English football, England is the home of football. The game was created there. Why do you think there is sort of a perception of English football as kind of, I won't say backwards tactically, but far less developed tactically than it is in other countries? Yeah, it's a good question. I think... uh I think the main reason is just traditionally we weren't really told or we weren't really brought up to think about football in a kind of strategic sense or a tactical sense. Mm. And, you know, I think English football has always been quite, uh, yeah, a little bit behind the times, as you say. Um, I think the the lack of top class English coaches at the moment really summarizes the story. We don't seem to just have the right environment to to develop people who think about football in uh, in the way that maybe Spanish or Italian coaches do. Yeah, I, I, and you, I think we saw last uh, year when Unai Emery took over at Arsenal, there were initially a few little questions about his tactics and how he might approach the game, and he answered them very openly and quite refreshingly because, you know, we're not used to managers being asked about tactics. Maybe it was because it was new, but over the course of the season, maybe it was because of how things were going with him. But that sort of faded away. There doesn't seem to be, yourself and some others obviously um, excluded from this, perhaps the same focus from elements of the media to explore the tactical side of the game with coaches the way that there is in, in other countries. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, it's funny when when it comes to asking coaches questions about tactics because often when I've tried, they don't really want to talk about it. You know, it's almost like uh, they get frustrated at the level of questions they get from the general media. But when when they are actually asked about something in depth, often I've found them quite uh, you know keen to move on and just answer kind of easier questions they can bat away. But uh, yeah, like you say, there's there's a kind of lack of real in-depth insight i think in certainly in newspapers you know the the concept of the match report is still dominating when you buy a newspaper on a monday that tends to tell you what has happened rather than why it's happened so yeah again it's something that uh, you know you look at la gazette della sport or marker and while people know those newspapers for 
kind of transfer rumors and that kind of mm-hmm. thing there's also lots of insight and lots of detail in there which you know we don't really have an equivalent of that in uh, in the uk yeah it, it's a cultural thing as much as anything isn't it and um yeah i do wonder why it hasn't maybe developed a bit more um uh, you know i remember when you when you started the website when you started zonal marking it was like whoa what's this guy doing because nobody Nobody was really doing it, certainly online. It, it yeah, was- it was it was a little bit of a gap in the market. And, you know, like I say, I kind of thought by now, 10 years on, there would be a little bit more of that in newspapers. But, uh, but yeah, the focus tends to be just on kind of so much emphasis upon press conferences and always trying to kind of chase the story and, and not really looking at, you know, the, some of the interesting things that have happened in the game. But... Of course, there's there's lots of internet uh, mm. avenues where where that is a bit more prevalent. But uh, yeah, in terms of the mainstream media, I think it's it's still somewhat lacking. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, it is online, and I think you know the the more that unofficial uh, fan sites and general football sites develop, there is more focus on the tactical side of the game, the statistical side of the game, all this information that we have uh, available to us. So uh, maybe that's where we're going to have to go and, and get it. And maybe that's where that culture will will develop. Um, you start the book looking at um, the Dutch and their influence over the way the game was played, Johan Cruyff. How groundbreaking were the developments that they put in place in the in the early seventies? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the probably the biggest revolution in football was uh, was total football in the nineteen seventies. The emphasis upon pressing, the emphasis upon playing out from the back, are two of the you know two of the main features that we're we're still talking about today as as popular concepts in modern football. So, yeah, to a certain extent, you can say that they they were the kind of founding side of modern football in the 70s and then the era i look at is is the uh, early to mid 90s with the dutch and mm. you see those those same kind of ideas uh, manifest themselves in in Cruyff's barcelona and particularly in in van Hal's ajax side yeah i i really enjoyed this line uh, early in the book where Cruyff is talking and he, he says i like to turn traditional thinking on its head by telling the striker that he's the first defender and the first thing that popped into my mind was Jack Charlton and John Aldridge. Um, <laughs> yeah, nice. A yeah. long, a long way from what Johan Cruyff was was trying to get his teams to do. But as a concept, it's sort of been applied across the spectrum in in the way managers have, have set up their teams. Yeah, I mean, it's funny now at both ends of the pitch. You sometimes see players who are very good all rounders, but maybe not particularly good at their specific. Job description. So, I mean, someone like you know Danny Welbeck, for example, who I know has has fallen out of favour and is is obviously leaving Arsenal. But I think a lot of people had a lot of time for him and really liked him as a player, despite the fact that he has never been prolific and he's never, you know, it doesn't look likely he'll ever be prolific. But he does bring so much in terms of his pressing skill and his uh, his his link play. Um, and then you look at someone at the other end of the pitch, someone like. You know David Lewis at Chelsea, who who clearly isn't a great defender, but is so confident on the ball that he brings, you know, he brings something extra to the attacking part of the side. So you do have these these kind of curious players that I guess fit into Cruyff's approach of of flipping things on their head. Yeah, you we, you um, dealing with the early nineties uh, and the Dutch, of course. Uh, we're we're talking on the. Uh, the day in 1995, this day in 1995, Arsenal signed Dennis Bergkamp, and obviously his influence at Arsenal is, um, you know, immeasurable. But, but within that within that Dutch system, um, he had a big impact too, didn't he? The way he was used um, by the various managers, you know, for the national team and also at Ajax. Um, this idea, what well, I'm sure I have it marked here in the book, but basically they invented another. Um, a shadow striker, isn't that what they called him? Where basically the number nine, which was Van Basten uh, in the national side, was somebody who made space for for Dennis Bergkamp to arrive late. Yeah, it was quite fun to go back and research Bergkamp's time at Ajax because, I, I, to be honest, I didn't know much about it. Obviously, know him a lot from from Arsenal, and and we all know he struggled a bit in Italy. But his time with Ajax was really interesting because. I mean, he topped the goal-scoring charts in in Holland three seasons in a row. And I know the Eredivisie can throw up some surprise names that then kind of struggle elsewhere. But, you know, we don't think of Burkamp as a prolific goal-scorer. He was always always more of a provider. But, yeah, he was was playing as a number 10, as you say. They kind of invented this word shadow striker to to say what his role was. And, yeah, he was... 
he was kind of seen as the main goal scoring uh, weapon in the side despite not leading the line and like you say the, the players that Ajax played up front often uh, Ronald De Boer at that point before he dropped into midfield and certainly for the national team with Van Basten it was all just about them creating space for Burkamp just behind and uh, yeah it was an interesting development his, his kind of rise to prominence at Ajax he kind of started as a right winger which is an, you know another kind of role that you don't really associate him with no. uh, having seen his Arsenal days and and basically was kind of fast tracked into the side by uh, by Van Howe who he initially had a very good relationship with and then uh, kind of turned sour when Burkamp decided to move on to Inter. Mm, it, that tends to happen a lot with Van Hal in this book. <laughs> yes, you're right. It's a <laughs> yeah, yeah there, there is a kind of a common denominator in all the uh, the issues that Van Hal has with people, and that is uh, Van Hal um, yeah. himself. I think it's quite curious as well, isn't it? Because when we think about Burkamp, we think about the role of the number ten and just how important the number ten was uh, in football. And now we're in an era where perhaps that role has become not antiquated, but certainly not as important as it used to be. And it's something that Pep Guardiola talked about um, when he f- he finished playing. Uh, he said, as uh, you quote him in the book, uh, he's you know, obviously not a number 10, but he, th- he says, I think players like me have become extinct because the game has become more tactical and more physical. And Arsenal at this moment in time have somebody who maybe five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, would have been considered uh, the archetypal number 10 in Mesut Ozil, a guy who could float around in the hole, provide the uh, the ammunition for the strikers. And it's sort of interesting to look at that dichotomy between how important that player was in the systems that were so effective then and how it's sort of fallen by the wayside now. It might come round again, of course, but right now it's hard to find a, uh, a role for that that classic number 10. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's kind of players that fit that mould, but they're increasingly forced to be at least capable of of playing in various positions, if not just deployed in a different position altogether. So, mm. yeah, we've seen we've seen a few players. I mean, Ozil himself has often been fielded in a kind of wider role and been asked to drift inside, which I've never been a particular fan of him playing that role. Um, I think he is better. He is more comfortable when he is in the in the centre and can drift between the lines. But uh, yeah, I mean, you look at how City are playing with, with Silver and De Bruyne, who were kind of considered number 10s before and, and are now kind of tucked into deeper midfield positions. So I guess there's still a room for that kind of player, but in a, in a different a different precise position, if you like. Yeah. Is there any correlation, do you think, between the, the success or the effective, effectiveness of national teams uh on the on the developments that that happen at club level as well because we can move on and talk about the french era and the players like Henri and Vieira and Anelka and Perez uh, uh Trezeguet these guys who emerged uh, who are very different um and were perhaps representative of their time so do do the developments at club level have an impact on national teams or is it a case that sometimes you get a crop of players or you get a national team that develops in a certain way that then has a, an influence on the way club teams play and approach the game yeah that's a really good question and i i think the answer is probably that it's changed a little bit over the last 20 years or so because I think it's now clear that the club game is just far more advanced than the international game, which probably wasn't the case in the 90s. You know, I think the Bosman ruling helped to kind of accelerate that. So with France and and that crop of players, you see quite an obvious philosophy that is kind of top down in France. You know, everyone knows about Claire Fontaine and, and you know, Anelka and Henri coming through that system. Um, Whereas, you know, whereas a lot of countries kind of, tried to replicate that model after France's success at 98 and Euro 2000. There's now been a shift away from that and more towards the German model um, that I'm sure everyone's read about with, um, you know, having regional development centres. And and that means that it's more the clubs being responsible um, for the development of players. So, yeah, it's kind of intertwined. But I think I think there's probably been a slight movement away from having a, you know, a uh, an over-reliance on, on the national federation to develop players. I suppose as well the, the the national outlook or the the various. Um, I mean, it's hard to sort of say that um, 
different countries have different personality traits completely. But I think there are certain things that you would identify with with certain countries that are are different. Um, you know, you, you you cite Germans being uh, always referred to as efficient when they go to <laughs> to to, uh, to tournaments. Uh, you know, whether that's to do with football or you know making their cars, uh, it's a word that follows them around. But you know, when we talked about the French coaches and Wenger, for example, at Arsenal, um, Gerard Houllier was another one. Uh, you say they weren't ideologists and they weren't grandmasters. They weren't sort of absolutely focused on the, the tactical intricacies of the game. Instead, they had the mentality of youth coaches and believed their fundamental job was to guide players and help them fulfill their potential, which, of course, any Arsenal fan listening to this uh, who lived through any period of the Arsene Wenger era will identify with immediately. Yeah, absolutely. I remember, I think uh, David Dean was once asked about Wenger and what his greatest quality was. And he said something along the lines of he turns average players into good players and good players into great players and great players into world class players. And I think that's what, you know, obviously there was a kind of philosophy and a a very obvious style of playing, particularly in the early years. But I think more than anything else, he was... uh, yeah, he almost felt like a, a youth coach who was working for a, a first team. He was brilliant at developing individuals. And you do have this slightly different mentality, I, th- I think, in France with the uh, with the coaches, as, as I say in that quote. And another interesting uh, example is Gerard Houllier, who, of course, kind of followed Wenger over to the Premier League a couple of years later after he was in charge of France and they had that disaster with not qualifying for the 94 World Cup with you know him blaming Ginola and everything. Yeah, yeah. He then dropped down to become the, I think, the joint under-19 and under-21 coach and, and helped to bring through Trezeguet and Henri and Anelka. And there's one youth tournament where he basically plays all three of those up front, which must have been quite a sight. But it's it seems like, to me, that would never happen in England. You, you would never have, you know, Steve McLaren after that Euro 2008 uh, failure to qualify he wouldn't then take charge of the under 21s but in france it was seen as okay this is a guy with great experience let's keep him in the in the kind of federation and, and get him in a you know important job bring through young players so yeah I, I think their their approach to management is a little bit different from uh from the other countries in europe you, uh, you talked about managers being reluctant to discuss tactics and wenger I think was all was definitely one of those. He very rarely liked to talk about his tactical approach. Some would say it's because he didn't really have one in that, you know, the players were told to go out there and enjoy themselves and express themselves and play to their potential and, and all that kind of stuff, which is great when you've got Bergkamp and you've got Henri and Pires and Vieira and, and these really, really intelligent footballers who who can kind of problem solve on the pitch themselves. But you can't be a manager as long as he was a manager without some measure of tactical um, astuteness or, or knowledge or, or what have you. I mean, why do you think there was a reluctance on his part and maybe some of the others to to talk about that t- uh, tactical approach? Was it just playing your, your your cards close to your chest because you didn't want people to, to know what you were doing? I mean, it wasn't that complex anyway. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I... I tend to go for the side of of Wenger kind of just didn't really see football in those terms he didn't really you know in in post-match interviews it was it was rare to see him say anything about really how Arsenal lost the game and maybe that was uh you know kind of in keeping with his his habit that often got mocked of you know saying he didn't see the incident if something (laughs) happened and I, I know that's a kind of it became a bit of a cliche but I always think if you're a manager sitting in the dugout, you just don't get a very good view of what's happening. And I think if I was in that situation, I'd often want a second view of, you know, I'd want a second view of it from from television before I really commented on anything. So, yeah, there's multiple factors. I, I think it's clear that Wenger was an excellent manager in certain ways, but I think probably his, his biggest shortcoming was his, his lack of real... Uh, tactical expertise particularly with kind of making changes within games he, he always tended to go for kind of straight swaps didn't he rather than changing system yeah or throw on all the strikers or throw on yeah. all the fullbacks and uh, you know maybe it wasn't such an issue when the Premier League was a little less developed tactically as it became because you had managers that came in and 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 really did focus on that I mean Jose Mourinho um was the prime example of that, I think. You know, there's there's obviously a lot 
uh, to do with his success has come down to the resources that he had available to him at Chelsea, but certainly in terms of how he approached the game and his background as a coach working with Bobby Robson and Van Hal as this kind of, uh, he was uh, a second in command or he was there to make analysis of, of certain parts of, of what they were doing. He He kind of, I'm not saying he changed the game completely, but he sort of, he was the first to add a real tactical element to uh, to the Premier League, and it became more and more important and more prevalent. Yeah, I think that's completely true. I think there was just such a shift in mentality in the Premier League in 2004. You know, Arsenal had just won the league with yeah. obviously an unbeaten season and playing wonderful kind of proactive football. And then Mourinho and Benitez came they just won European trophies and they just took a completely different, more defensive, more tactical, more reactive approach to the game. And to a certain extent, I think Arsenal really struggled to to adapt to that and keep up. Although, you know, sometimes you look at those big games. I remember the, um, the Champions League game that Arsenal lost to Anfield in 2008, I think. The game when, uh, you know, when Walcott went on that run yeah. and set up Adebayor and then Liverpool scored almost straight away. Yeah. I remember the starting wide players for Arsenal in that game were uh, Ibue and Diaby, which is, you know, that's a few years later from playing Piroz and Jungberg on the flank. So yeah. Wenger clearly did adjust or try to adjust and become a little bit more defensive and a little bit more... Yeah, solid in wide positions. Um, but like you say, Mourinho really changed the game uh, in England. Maybe hasn't been as, as much of a revolutionary in European terms. But yeah, in the Premier League when he came, it was suddenly a really different different ball game, I guess. Yeah, and like for a long time, teams in England didn't vary their tactics. You know, you yeah. would have more or less one formation and there was sort of a shift. And then all of a sudden we were getting three at the back and five at the back. And, and you know, Sam Allardici, of course, uh, <laughs> we, we, we best not forget his uh, impact on it. But but coming back to, to Wenger, um, you know, obviously as things started shifting again, if we go from uh, from Holland to France and then we start looking towards Spain and the impact that uh, Spanish football and Spanish coaches had on the game, Wenger, you know, having been maybe the archetype of, of what was great about the French model, he sort of pivoted towards what was good about the Spanish model and what, you know, what was going on at Barcelona and possession football, which was obviously something that Wenger was into because he always wanted his team to have the ball and to attack and to play good attacking football. Um, maybe it sort of got a little bit fudged along the way as he sort of went from the likes of Henri Vieira Perez to smaller, more technical players. And you think of Sesc obviously was, was uh, the, the, the key player in that system, but uh, the likes of Kleb and Rosicki, for example, who, who would have fit much more into a Barcelona side than they would have Wenger's invincibles, for example. Yeah, I completely agree. And, I think Arsenal kind of lost their way at that point. And I was always surprised a little bit how much reverence uh, Wenger showed towards Barcelona. I mean, clearly they're an outstanding team and they revolutionized the game and they perfected that possession philosophy. And Arsenal were always a side who, who tried to have the ball and had good ball players. But for me, Arsenal sides were always at their best when they really offered some speed and directness and counter-attacking play. And I think you can see that with the wide players. I think Arsenal were really defined in, in the glory years by the likes of Pires and uh, Jungberg and Overmars before them, you know, quick players who, who got into the box and scored goals. And when there was a shift towards Rosicki and Kleb and Nasri and Arshavin, who were all very good players and yeah. and and had a bit of speed, but there, there tended to be so many games, I thought, where you had two wide players coming inside between the lines and just trying to play incessant passes that basically we're, we're not breaking down the opposition. And uh, I, I think you can almost look at the rise and fall of Arsenal by the wide players and basically how direct they were because, yeah, I associate Arsenal's kind of winning goals and title campaigns in particular with, you know, Overmars sprinting forward at breakneck speed or, or Jungberg going in behind or Pires. And I think Arsenal kind of lost some of that urgency and, and directness during those years. Was there maybe an element of teams being better organised and more organised defensively and tactically working things out in a way that they, they probably didn't or couldn't before because of the type of managers that they had? Because I think if you look back in the Premier League, um, 
the the fall or the the lack of prevalence of English coaches now uh, there were a lot more English coaches back when when Arsenal were winning things more and more foreign coaches have come in and they've come in with defined tactical ideas and and ways to approach the game which makes it more difficult when you're playing perhaps a bit more off the cuff yeah I think it's true and I think Arsenal suffered a lot as well from from maybe the the inequality in the league that meant that a lot of teams went to Highbury or went to the Emirates in general um, because it was during that period where Arsenal moved, of course, um, and kind of played really, really deep. And I think Arsenal took a while to kind of adjust to that because when you go back and you look at that, you know, Wenger's first title winning season, 97-98, teams were just so poorly equipped for playing against an Elka uh and Burkamp, you know, mm. when those two combined, an Elka with his speed and Burkamp between the lines, you had these centre backs who were basically set up for dealing with target men, and they couldn't cope with Burkamp's kind of, uh, you know, a positional sense and couldn't cope with an Elka's speed. But yeah, fast forward 15 years, and you get teams playing much, much deeper because just the standard approach has become almost that early Wenger approach of playing with pace, and they know that they've got to sit deep and. And, you know, it, to use one of the cliches, I think Arsenal struggled to to break down teams by having, a, you know, something different and a, a bit of a yeah. a bit of a penalty box force, which I think, to be fair, Wenger did address in, in later years. Talk to me about Pep Guardiola and his influence over the game. Uh, you know, that Barcelona side was obviously amazing. And I've seen Arsenal in the new Camp take a pasting more than once uh, yeah. from teams that, that he put out or teams that he basically he basically built. Um, what he's doing at, at Manchester City, uh, you know, to go through the season that they, uh, they did this uh, last year to win the title the way that they did, you know, uh, it was amazing. Um, I might ask you a, a little bit, in a minute about the the way he's been able to do that or or perhaps um the resources he's had available to him to make those uh those things happen but as a coach and as somebody who who sets his team up in a very specific way how how has he developed from the barcelona when he when he first started at barcelona to what he's doing now at manchester city in terms of how he wants his teams to play and the kind of football he's looking for them to play yeah, I think he's changed a lot, actually. I mean, when he first came to prominence at Barcelona, people thought he was just purely one way, purely the Barcelona way. And, you know, when he went to Bayern, that was his intention, to basically transfer his his Barcelona methods onto, onto Bayern Munich. And I think in the end, it became a much more compromised kind of system between his Spanish beliefs, if you like, and the kind of German sense of, A, playing on the counterattack, and B, maybe more importantly than anything, guarding against the counter-attack. So that's what we've seen in particular with his, you know, fairly revolutionary use of fullbacks, bringing them inside rather than overlapping because, uh, you know, he was so afraid of how good German sides were playing very quick counter-attacks. So he's he's changed more than I expected, to be fair, in Germany and, and also in England because, you know, his first season was a real, quite a big struggle for him, really. I mean, yeah. they came fourth. Um, they lost some matches quite heavily. And he did talk about kind of English concepts in a way that he never had done before. So he was really shocked at the emphasis on on basically getting the second balls in midfield. Yeah. And I remember that game, uh, I think, in his first season when City beat Arsenal just before Christmas. And he said that they'd spent a couple of training sessions just working on picking up the second ball, picking up the loose ball, because it was just a lot more scrappy in England than he'd than he'd been used to elsewhere. So he had that obstacle to overcome. And then I think once... Once he kind of adjusted and realised there was a certain physicality and maybe mental approach required for English football, he's he's subsequently been able to you know implement his more uh, the kind of things we expect in terms of the the possession play. Yeah, I mean there is it's hard to escape the 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 fact that you know at Barcelona, which is one of the big biggest clubs in Europe, there was a lot of money, and he also was blessed with you know, two or three of the best players in the world at that time, certainly Messi, and you think of Xavi and Iniesta and, and Busquets, who were really so important to the way that he wanted to play at Bayern Munich, you know, the biggest club in Germany, so his dominance of the, the Bundesliga was, I'm not going to say it was easy, but you know, you could see how mm. it helped him steamroller at Manchester City, it's the richest club in England, uh, they obviously have found 
ways around FFP and congratulations to them for that. Nobody's found out yet. So this is a bit of a, an exclusive <laughs> here on the, on the podcast, but you know, the, how, how much can you separate that from, from what it is he does? I mean, I'm not trying to take anything away from him as a coach because he's obviously brilliant. Uh, and the way he thinks about the game is sort of almost like a football savant in some ways, but it really helps if you've got all the resources in the world to to put into place your plans. Yeah, I mean, he's he's had success wherever he's been in terms of the league. Hasn't quite done it in the Champions League since since at Barcelona, but he hasn't had as you know as complete an impact as Wenger when he first came to Arsenal in terms of transforming the club. You can say the same about Klopp. I would say at, at two clubs now, and also Conte at Juventus and and Chelsea. You know, they were really struggling the season before he came in. So. Yeah, it's a bit of a cliche, but it would be fascinating to see how he works with a lower, a lower side. But uh, yeah, I can't really see it happening anytime soon. Well, so. I mean, that, yeah, I mean that's the thing about being that good and that successful. You know, you're out of the reach of of lower sides, and you have um, the best clubs in the in the world to to pick from. He was run really, really close by by Jurgen Klopp uh, last season, and Liverpool had. You know, ordinarily, it would be a title-winning season. Uh, the amount of points that they won—it's um, an interesting. Uh, maybe it's not a parallel, but it, it feels to me like if I'm going to be vaguely hopeful about uh, Arsenal for the future, that's some sort of parallel uh, with Liverpool. Um, because you know, when Klopp took over, his first season wasn't great. It's taken him a number of years to get to to where they are now. Um, I'm not saying Unai Emery is is Arsenal's answer to Jurgen Klopp or, or anything like that, but um, it, it does show that if you do get the right coach and you do invest time and there's some money, of course, that Liverpool have, have generated in the right man and you give him some time and he has a clear, defined idea about what way he wants to play, which I think Klopp does. You know, he's refined it uh, since he arrived in England. You know, it... it it's possible to challenge the the financial heavyweights. Yeah, I think that's very fair. And I think the other thing in, in you have to look at with Liverpool is they've made such clever signings. I mean, they yeah. haven't really brought in many superstars. Okay, last summer was a bit of an exception with, with Van Dijk and Alisson, but they've picked up some really clever players. You know, players that were getting relegated from the Premier League, like Shakiri and Wijnaldum and Andy Robertson, of course. So, I mean, to go back to the early Wenger days, again, that's what Arsenal were so good at. They were good at finding bargains that had been overlooked elsewhere. And, uh, you know, the, a lot's been said about the transfer strategy of last summer. But, um, you know, even on paper, they were quite unexciting signings and didn't really suggest you know much of a grand plan but uh yeah maybe that's a discussion for another day yeah maybe so i mean it's probably an impossible question to ask you but i mean can you see maybe the start of something else that's happening in football do you think perhaps external factors might play a part in how the game develops and how it's played um i think of var for example being introduced um, to the Premier League from next season. I mean, it, it was at the World Cup last year and generally I think it worked quite well. And all I can see this summer in my Twitter timeline are people going absolutely bananas about VAR <laughs> and the impact that it's having on Copa America, the Women's World Cup. Uh, you know, might it be that those factors or, or things that are outside the control of coaches, clubs and players force the next shift in whatever that might be yeah possibly i mean i think what we're seeing now is we're seeing almost the rules having to be clarified more because of var because everything's being taken so so literally and so strictly um i mean one interesting thing i think that is happening ahead of next season is this change with how the how the goal kicks are being allowed to be taken so previously any goal kick had to be played outside the penalty area to a defender whereas from next year attackers have to stay outside the box but you can play the ball short you know you can pass to a defender inside the six yard box from a goal kick if, if you want to so I think that's going to be quite interesting because teams play such a you know they put so much emphasis on playing out from the back and this will allow teams just a little bit maybe two or three extra seconds just to breathe and be able to play the ball out with less risk of, of being pressed so high up the pitch um at least not immediately. So that could be quite 
interesting, I think, in the first few weeks of the season. I think there will be teams who try and do some clever things in terms of coming up with new passing patterns out of the back. But uh, yeah. yeah, that might be the kind of thing that only I find interesting and everyone <laughs> else doesn't care about. No, but I mean, you, you, you talk fairly early in the book about how the back pass rule had such a profound impact on, on the game and the way that footballers or goalkeepers had to become footballers as well. Um, and it's not quite the same thing, but... It might well have an impact. Um, you know, Arsenal famously, well, at least for the first part of last season, tried to play out from the back at all costs uh, mm-hmm. until there was a slightly more pragmatic approach taken to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it might well change the way that, that teams build from from the back. And, it's you know, I guess we won't know until, until we see it put in action. Um, just a couple of quick things before we go um, to talk maybe specifically about Unai Emery and his role as a as a tactician, and he came to the club as somebody who was uh, hailed as tactically more flexible than Arsene Wenger, um, who you know who sent his team out to do one thing and one thing only. Whereas Emery uh, is somebody who will shift things up during a game. I think probably the best example of that um, of a tactical battle between two coaches that we saw last season from an Arsenal point of view anyway was the the North London derby the first one at the Emirates where Arsenal I think started with a back four and ended with a back three and Tottenham started with a back three and ended with a with a back four and the two managers tweaked their teams uh, during the game it worked out well for Arsenal because they, they they ended up winning that one 4-2 but as the season went on it became much more difficult to identify what what Emery's tactical approach was exactly. Um, are you expecting a bit more clarity from him next season? Because, you, again, going back to that Guardiola uh, example where he realised, I, I do have to adapt to certain elements of, of the English game, even if he felt like he wasn't going to have to do that because his own philosophy was so pure. Um, it might well be a case that, that this season has shown Emery one or two things that he needs to adapt to. Yeah, quite possibly. I mean, um, I must say I'm not really expecting too much more clarity because, I, you know, my view on Emery is that he's basically a kind of pure tactician. He doesn't really believe in a, a philosophy or a default way of playing. Um, I guess the exception to that is we we did see a couple of kind of um, patterns of play last year which worked well. I thought in the first few months of the season – getting better in on the overlap was clearly a big part of Arsenal's approach. And he was a real key attacker. And of course, after his injury, that tended to shift to the other flank in, in Kolasinac, who, who racked up a lot of assists and key passes. Although, you know, I still have my question marks about him defensively, but in terms of an overall formation and overall structure, I'm, I'm not convinced that Emery is really looking towards doing that. I mean, maybe we'll, um, It'd be, it'd be good to see, I think, a little bit more consistency with the with the defence because there's mm. been a lot of switching between three and four at the back over the last couple of years with, with Wenger and, and Emery as well. Yeah. And I tend to think that you need a balance. You know, it's good to have a side who can adapt, but I think, you know, if you have the basic structure in place and then you can kind of tweak things in the final third, I, th- I think that's when Arsenal were kind of at their best last you know last season when things did go well it was often when the tweaks were okay we're going to switch Obama Young and Lacazette or we're going to play Ozil and Mkhitaryan in different positions rather than basically changing the entire side which I think tends to cause too much instability yeah I was going to ask you about the defense and you know the 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 inability to field the same back four I think had a you know an impact and obviously there were injuries to Bellerin and Holding and uh, Koscielny was injured and Socrates was in and out of the team and Mustafi was in the team so uh, <laughs> <laughs> well you know as I beat around the bush here it, it, it was a problem um, but I, you know I like you I, I feel like uh, having some kind of a platform and then changing it within games or even if you have to change it at halftime it's this sort of constant like uh back three one week back four the next week i'm not sure that really helps a team defensively and i don't think that was borne out in the you know the the statistics anyway uh if you want to break them down to very basics arsenal conceded as many goals in emery's first season as we did in in wenger's worst one which was you know the season he decided to to step down or or was let go or whatever way you want to look at it so you know doing something to um create uh, a platform from which the players can can work around seems to me a, a really important part of what he's got to do for next season 
Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that is, I think that basically the main thing for his second season, I think, is that he needs to show the Arsenal fans and I guess more crucially the Arsenal board that there's something that he's actually working towards because, you know, even last season when there was that big unbeaten run at the start of the campaign, in fact, a winning run at the start of the campaign after the the first two defeats, um, it was tough to really see what the grand plan was. And I think that's... It's difficult to have faith in a manager if if you can't really see that they're working towards something. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a, a funny campaign for Arsenal. You know, uh, there was, was a couple of parts where it looked like it was going to be okay. You know, finishing the top four and maybe regrouping. There's still improvements that need to be made, but you know, you can't even really hold on to you know the final placing is anything to to really be excited about or or there's been any great improvement. So. Yeah, I think the very, the jury is very much still out. I know a lot of Arsenal fans have already become frustrated with, with Emery and, yeah. and maybe wouldn't be sad to see the back of him. I think it's probably right to give him the opportunity to to go again in the second season. But uh, yeah, we, you, need to, you need to really see an identity and, and work towards something. Otherwise, it's uh, it will just be like this forever, I guess. Yeah, and one final thing when we talk about that and talk about the... The need to refresh and rebuild ahead of ahead of the new season does it make recruitment more difficult if you don't have that identity or philosophy? Where you know you could look at uh, uh, Guardiola's first season at Manchester City, and you could see immediately that he knew he needed to get new fullbacks, and I think. In his second season, the first thing he did was uh, bring in new fullbacks. Sanya went out, Clichy went out, maybe somebody else went out. He he brought in a a couple of players in those positions. Whereas you look at it um, at Arsenal and you could sort of make a case to buy someone everywhere, uh, which obviously isn't (laughs) realistic. But if you do have a plan or a philosophy or a way you want to play, you know, filling in the gaps... um, incrementally because you can't do it all in one window at least if you can do it incrementally you know what you're doing it's hard to know where arsenal are going to buy i mean obviously buy a fucking central defender please uh, and maybe buy a you know a fullback and a, a midfielder and an attacker like i said everywhere <laughs> it's hard isn't it to to sort of pin down a, a recruitment strategy when the the needs are so broad yeah, I think that's a very fair point and, and a decent way of looking at it. And yeah, you look at Liverpool, I mean, it was quite obvious from from early in Klopp's time that one, they were very good at pressing high up the pitch and two, they got you know some very good attacking players in, in place and kind of sorted that section of the side. And basically they worked backwards and kind of completed the defence and got a good goalkeeper in. And it was almost like they they were kind of nine out of ten in various positions, but then six out of ten in various positions. Yeah. I kind of think Arsenal are almost seven out of ten in a lot of areas. And like you say, it's going to be quite a long term rebuilding job to really get everyone up to scratch for a for a title bid. And you know, to repeat the point we kind of touched on earlier, you, you can't really see that they're any closer to the end goal than they were in the final days of Wenger. Mm, whatever that goal is, we don't quite know. Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. Michael, listen, brilliant. Thanks a million for your time. The book is called Zonal Marking, the making of European football. Um, best of luck with it and we'll, we'll catch up soon. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed to Michael Cox. Uh, he's on Twitter at Zonal underscore Marking, at Zonal underscore Marking. Handily, that is also the name of his brand new book, which is out now, Zonal Marking, The Making of Modern European Football. It's published by Harper Collins. It's available in lovely hardback, which I've got here, and it's fab. You can also get it as an ebook from all the usual uh, ebook places you know where they are and uh, there's an accompanying podcast which michael is releasing throughout the summer so if you go to zonalmarking.net forward slash podcasts uh, you can find the first couple of episodes there he's going to release them throughout the summer and i'm sure it is available on your favorite podcasting app as well Okay, I told you I'd give you a chance to win a copy of Michael Cox's Zonal Marking book. You can do that very simply by sending an email to competition at arsblog.com and answer the following question. In the discussion with Michael, we talked about Dennis Bergkamp, who was, of course, a brilliant number 10 at Arsenal, and the difficulties in the modern game for uh, our current number 10, Mesut Ozil. But who was the Arsenal number 10 before Mesut Ozil? 
Very simple. Send me an email with your answer to competition at arsblog.com. I'll pick a winner and announce it on next week's show. Right. Going to leave it there for this week. There's not a great deal else going on. James and I will be here on Monday. We'll have an Arsecast Extra for you then. If you'd like to give the show a rating or review on iTunes, that would be great. Thank you very much indeed for that in advance. And let's hope that between now and next Friday, uh, ahead of the next Arsecast, we're not eating boiled cabbage. We're having a nice... Um, toasted ham and cheese sandwich of a footballer. That'd be all right. It's a good, solid, reliable, dependable sandwich. If we could do with one of those at the center of our defense. Ham and cheese, center half, please, Arsenal, if you don't mind. All right, until the next one, take it easy, folks. Cheers. Bye-bye. Stanley Enos Lavender Kronke, you stand before this court today, charged with that most heinous of crimes, a crime so abhorrent and against the natural order of things that it makes my skin crawl. Feeding people boiled cabbage. How do you plead? Ah, uh, not guilty. I acknowledge your plea of not guilty, and I stick it right back up your bum. I sentence you to life imprisonment without trial and with no possibility of parole. You will spend the rest of your days in darkness, fed only that second most abhorrent of things. Nando's. Take him away! No! <laughs>